Thanks for joining us for tonight's event. My name is Kevin. I'm one of the event hosts here at Powell's Books. And before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. And if you don't already do so, please follow us on our social medias, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and also our YouTube channel. Tonight, we're honored to welcome Leonard Mladenov in conversation with Ben Ehrlich. We've all been told that thinking rationally is the key to success, but at the cutting edge of science, researchers are discovering that feelings is, feeling is every bit as important as thinking. You make hundreds of decisions every day from what to eat for breakfast to how you should invest, and not one of those decisions would be possible without emotion. It has long been said that thinking and feeling are separate and opposing forces in our behavior. But as Leonard Mladenov tells us, extraordinary advances in psychology and neuroscience have proven that emotions are as critical to our well-being as thinking. How can you connect better with others? How can you make sense of your frustration, fear, and anxiety? What can you do to live a happier life? The answers lie in understanding your emotions, journeying from the labs of pioneering scientists to real world scenarios that have flirted with disaster, Mladenov shows us how our emotions can help, why they sometimes hurt, and what we can learn in both instances. Told with his characteristic clarity and fascinating stories, emotional, how feelings shape our thinking, explores the new science of feelings and offers us an essential guide to making the most of one of nature's greatest gifts. Mladenov is joined in conversation by Ben Ehrlich. He's a senior reader at the New England Review, as well as the author of the forthcoming book, The Brain in Search of Itself. This evening's event also includes an audience Q&A. Please use that Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question at any time. And if someone has typed a question that you also would like to know the answer to, you can actually upvote that particular question by clicking the thumbs up. Perhaps most importantly, please support our authors and pals by purchasing a copy of Emotional, How Feelings Shape Our Thinking from Us. A link to buy that book and Dr. Mladenov's other books will be shared in the chat this evening, as well as a link to pre-order Ben's book. Without further ado, please welcome Leonard Mladenov and Ben Ehrlich. Thanks, Kevin. Um, it's really great to be here with Len. Uh, ever since finishing your book last week, I've been looking forward to talking with you. Um, it was excellent and I learned so much and it was so enjoyable. Um, my first question can't be anything other than how are you feeling? <laughs> I'm feeling very positive and, and relaxed. And looking forward to our chat. Good. Um, I, you know, that's a sort of reference to the chapter that you wrote on core affects. Um, can you just explain to everyone why that's so important? And, and as with many of the discoveries you cite in the book, I'm curious about what personal effect it had for you um, after you learned about it. So okay, well, let's start with core affect. And it's a kind of core affect is a kind of proto emotion. It, it's each emotion has a, is pretty specific, and emotion is a, we'll get into this later, but it's a, a functional state of the brain that, that shapes the way your brain processes information. And core affect is something a little more, less differentiated than that. So whereas emotion might be disgust or fear, and it's very specific, and, and it's a response to specific types of situations and a specific type of response, core affect is not differentiated, it just has two dimensions. One is positive versus negative, and the other is relaxed versus energetic. And what scientists have found is that we, we have, we each have a core affect, which is um, produced by uh, the inputs from our body to our brain. So it's, it's kind of a temperature reading of our state of, of being, of homeostasis. Are we, in a good, are we in good physical condition? Are we tired? Are we too cold, too hot? hungry, starving, um, not hungry, uh, different bodily uh, situations get fed into as well as your immediate environment. Are we about to get eaten? Are we in a, some very high tense situation or not? And that all gets kind of melded in a very general way and forms what's called the core affect, which is, a, which is something that you always have, but you're not always aware of. 
it, 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 when Ben asked me that, I sit, sat there and thought, what is my core affect? What's my general state of being? And I said, I was uh, relaxed and positive. Um, so I was aware of it then. But generally, as we go through the day, you're not aware of it, but it, it does have an effect on, on your thinking. Yeah, that, and that's the main, you know, that's one of the main messages of the book is, is how emotion affects our thinking. And it, and it, and it does so in a way that's not as ha not hazardous in the way that um, people used to think. And so I'm just curious, uh, you know, about your relationship to, you know, your own emotions and whether this book was conceived out of some insight about personal insight, or was it that you found the studies and then were reflecting on your own experience of emotion or how, how you know, it's a very personal book. Um, for the you know for those who've read it, so I, I'm curious about how how and when you conceived of it. So I got interested in the brain and in the mind and how we think about uh, 15 years ago. And I had a friend. I was at Caltech on the faculty there, and I had a friend named Christoph Koch, who was oh, yeah. uh, an eminent uh, neuroscientist, and and he invited me to learn about it in his lab. And I participated for several years in, in his lab and all their seminars and lectures. I took courses, I read hundreds of papers and I studied the field and spoke with him and had a lot of fun with him and his graduate students, his postdocs and really dove into it. And that was the result of all that was my uh, first book on the brain called Subliminal, uh, How Your Unconscious Mind Rules Your Behavior. And it was an exploration of hidden forces that that really govern your thinking, your feeling, things that are automatic in you that you're not aware of, that we can, however, study and delineate, and that have a, a huge effect on your decision making and your thinking. And I learned a lot about people and about myself writing that book, and so it whet my appetite to do more <laughs> more of them. Uh, I wrote another one called Elastic a couple of years ago about uh, how we get ideas and creativity, and then. Uh, I was looking for another book to write, and I realized that, like my original book, Subliminal, uh, emotions have uh, are always there in the background and have an enormous and unrecognized and often actually misunderstood effect on your decision making and your thinking, uh, your your processing of information. And so I started to study that, and I had another friend. So all my books are connected with Caltech friends. <laughs> That's Ralph Ralph Adolphs, and. Uh, He's an eminent also uh, neuroscientist, but in particular, he studies emotion. So I went to him and I said, hey, Ralph, I'm thinking of studying emotion. And uh, so, you know, let's talk about it. And he said, oh, my God, emotion. There's been such an explosion of research in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, the field is being revolutionized. It's like, oh, don't, you know, don't don't take that on. That's just uh, too much to digest. And I said, no, no, that's just perfect for me because I want something exciting that's being revolutionized and that has an explosion of research. I don't want something where I'm writing the same old stuff. If he had said, oh, yeah, we figured that out 30 years ago. Uh, why don't you write another book on it? <laughs> I would have said, oh, there's plenty of books on it, but actually there weren't. And I realized that the way that uh, scientists think about emotion has changed quite a bit and in exciting ways and informed by amazing new technologies and that it hasn't really reached the uh, popular culture, which tends to still view often emotion as something to be suppressed, something to uh, be avoided and, and something that's counterproductive in your rational decision-making. And since that's not true, I thought it was a very ripe field to, to write about. And I've had a lot of fun uh, doing it and it was a lot of work. And uh, I, I did learn a lot about myself and about other people. And I think I gave my emotional intelligence a good bump up by doing that. And I hope that uh, people who read the book will get the same bump. <laughs> yeah, I did too from reading it. And, and especially just for those who are going to read the book, um, there's like, there are like seven surveys that you, that you have in there that, you know, for, for different, for, I guess, sort of, you can tell me better than I, than I know, but scaling your different emotions, how, you know, how prone you are, how much you experience them. And uh, they were, that was kind of revelatory. So that's, that's another kind of, that's like a, I felt like a really great resource inside of like, you know, in the midst of all that the book had to offer. Um, well, that was fascinating. It, um, it comes, I put it toward the end. What I, what I realized when I was doing the research was that one way you, that we could understand how uh, researchers think about each emotion is to look at, at how they measure them. So in order to study something in science, it's very valuable to be able to measure it, you know, quantify it or measure it in some way and certainly define it precisely. 
And so for various research purposes, uh, uh, researchers have over the years developed these, they call them inventories, but they're, they're questionnaires that you can take and answer some questions and you get a score and you can see from your score how, how susceptible, maybe that's not the best word, but how um, you, your, your, emo your tendencies may be to feel that emotion or maybe to resist feeling that emotion. And you can see which emotions are the ones that you uh, gravitate toward, that you tend to experience more of and which that, that you don't. And that's really interesting. I mean, first of all, it's interesting to look at the questions and see how they're probing that emotion kind of as a definitional uh, way of uh, studying the emotion. But it's also, if you take them, you, you learn something about yourself. And I think that connects you more to what I'm saying in the book. And you start to realize and think about yourself and learn about yourself and what, where, where your tendencies are. Because even though as a human species, we all have the same emotional machinery, and it's different than say that, that a gorilla or a bonobo has or a fruit fly. And yes, fruit flies have emotion. So uh, there's much different than that of other species, but within this species, there's, there's still individual variation. And some of it is individual variation in, in your nature. And some of it comes from, from your nurture or your growing up. So in that chapter, you can explore that. Right. So, um, yeah, we, so you've referenced this sort of old way of thinking about emotions as hindrances or even sort of saboteurs. Um, and what your book does is explains how necessary and, um, yeah, how necessary they are to our, our mental processes. I'm just wondering if you, did you used to subscribe to that old view? Like, you know, you talk about your childhood some in the book, but did you grow up thinking that about your own emotions? Yeah, I think I, well, not, before I studied emotion, I pretty much subscribed to the, the general wisdom about emotion, uh, most of which is, is wrong. It, it's, it's not uh, wrong in a terrible way. It's just wrong it's just wrong. <laughs> and it, it, it's, it's a kind of a superficial, uh, intuitive explanation that when you study it closely, doesn't really hold water. Like, for example, I, I think the first uh, uh, scientific study, real deep scientific study of emotion came from Darwin. And he, of course, was interested in how emotion relates to evolution. He identified what he called six basic emotions, um, anger, fear, surprise, disgust, uh, happiness and, and sadness. And he looked at th those emotions in other animals, in non-human animals, and he concluded that they, they served a, a very important purpose. They, they, first of all, could spur the animal to, to acting in a way that would save it or benefit it. So if, if a, I don't know, if um, uh, a small mammal comes into contact with a bear, fear could result and the mammal will run away. Also, he talked quite a bit about the expression of the emotion. So he felt that emotion was a way that animals who don't have language, of course, or much language, they, that's a way they can communicate with each other. Uh, it's a way they can tell their, their cohorts when there's danger or other issues going on. And it's also a way they can signal their rivals. For example, if you growl, it says, don't come near me, I'm going to fight you. So be ready. So back off or whatever. So it, it serves a huge communication purpose. And um, Darwin looked at how people behave. And he concluded that that purpose, we've kind of outgrown the purpose that emotions serve and that they're a vestige kind of like uh, the appendix. So they evolved and they were very useful when we were living in the wild and before we uh, became uh, we settled down, developed language and culture, but that uh, also before our brains evolved the ability to think rationally and logically and, and to the extent that we do today, the great extent that we do today. And that now in nowadays, logical, rational thinking is, is superior and we don't need that and maybe emotions are counterproductive. And so that was kind of the theory that, uh, that I, without reading Darwin's book when I was in whatever high school or college and, you know, uh, was growing up, that's, the, that's kind of the theory that you get through the culture, uh, along with a, a lot of sexist components that entered over the years too, about women uh, being more emotional and un irrational and all kinds of other nonsense. And so it turns out that that all that is, is totally wrong. Uh, just look at a couple aspects of it. Um, first of all, today we, we talk about some people will 
talked about basic emotions, but we've really expanded the, the emotions that we study seriously and take seriously. We include a lot of social emotions, uh, awe, uh, um, jealousy, um, embarrassment, and, and study those very, and realize that recognize the importance of those, which really make it, make us much more able to exist in a cooperative environment with other humans. And even other emotions uh, that they call homeostatic emotions that used to be considered drives like hunger, for example. So we've, I think we've really expanded the, 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 the realm of emotions, but even more than that, we've realized that the categories of emotions that we talk about are, are just really approximations and not to be taken too seriously. That, that, that each emotion is not really unitary uh, in the sense that it's, it's one thing. Uh, take fear, for example. Scientists have actually found that uh, there's different kinds of fear, which if you, if you introspect, you might, of course, realize that just like there's different kinds of pain, a headache versus a burn or a stomach ache, right? Well, there's different kinds of fear and studies, uh, scientists who are studying this have found, for example, that uh, the, the fear that you have, of, if there's like a scorpion on your arm, is, is, uh, takes place through different mental processes than the fear of, of say, uh, drowning or suffocating. And in fact, that that latter fear doesn't involve the amygdala, for example, whereas the former one does. So there are really different fears. And that's one of the beauties of studying emotion with neuroscience instead of just behavioral studies, because we can see these things in the brain and really have a hard facts behind what we're saying now. So there's many kinds of fear. There's many kinds of disgust. The disgust of a rotten apple is not the same as the disgust of a rotten politician, right? But they're both disgust and, and our, our maybe uh, our emotion of disgust, which originally involved only for food, has now been taken over and, and used as a social emotion. Uh, but there's different kinds of disgust. Uh, surprise can be, for example, is an important emotion, but surprise can be positive and surprise can be negative, and they're not the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. So each emotion that we category that we talked about is really a whole basket of emotions. And the, even the delineation between the categories is fuzzier than we think. So uh, you might think that fear and anxiety are separate emotions, but there are areas where they seem to overlap. Or if you talk to people, some will call this situation fear, some will call the same situation anxiety. So a lot of what Darwin said is kind of, kind of sort of true, but not really true. And when we study the details, that's what we we find out and we, we get a much deeper understanding of what emotion is. You mentioned the uh, blurred lines between the emotions that we mistakenly delineate cleanly. And it made me remember that my favorite, one of my favorite parts of the book, which is when you talk about how different cultures have different, not only different words, which we knew, but actually different emotions. And it made me think of the Turkish word for, I'm not gonna say it, but I wrote it down. Um, it's a combination of sadness and anger um, and the other one that I really liked just, you know, was the Ilongot tribe of the Philippines, which has a word for the particular type of aggression that follows a headhunt, right? Am I, am I getting that right? Yeah, yeah. I'm just curious, what, what are your favorite facts that you, you know, because the book is so rich with kind of great, great and surprising and fascinating facts. What, what's something that you remember learning that really, that you kind of... Well, well, I actually, in each uh, chapter, there were, I thought, amazing facts about myself and others that that um, that uh, really increased my understanding of, 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 of humans. Uh, th those weren't necessarily fun facts like the ones you just mentioned. If you want my favorite fun facts, well, there, there's a lot of those too, but uh, I, I think in it, one was uh, I learned that I was talking about the mind-body connection and how one, one thing that I talked about in the book that, that I hadn't I, mean, I had realized that there is a mind body connection and that your emotions and your, and your, um, your bodily situation are connected, but exactly how tight it is and how important it is. Uh, that's something that was new to me. For example, in, in, in rats, they've done experiments where they take the, um, the, the they, they, they sterile, they, they give a, a rat antibiotics kind of clear out its, its gut microbiome and then they they reseed it with feces from another rat and, and if the other rat uh they can have different kinds of rats that that are um some that are anxious and some that are calm for example and they will uh depending on whose feces they give to the new to the rat that's getting like a, a reboot that rat will become take on the characteristics the emotional characteristics of donor rat 
that was like blew my mind. I thought that was amazing. Now, I don't want to say now go out and eat a happy person's poo. <laughs> it's not, you know, first of all, a lot of stuff works in animals. It doesn't work in humans. So let me say that. And, um, and uh, so for many reasons, you don't want to necessarily do that. But, uh, you know, and there's more studying going on on that. But that, that, that really was, was an eye opener. Uh, in terms of the, the 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 how important your your bodily connection is, um, one other one in the same lines that I have to mention uh, was the one about head transplants. Uh, it, it turns out that there's a whole history of a century, and I, you'll read the book. You can read about it of people trying to do head transplants, believe it or not, and they've done some on animals. And there are people who plan to do in China to do a uh, head transplant on a human, and. What was really interesting was the analysis of one uh, neuro, uh, neuroscientist who was studying that, at, who, who said, uh, for all the other reasons, and there are many, that you don't want to do a head transplant or why it would be uh, difficult. Or uh, well, the idea, by the way, wasn't just to switch people's heads. It's to take the head of someone who's dying and put it on the body of someone who died of a head injury. So it's, it's, at least it had a purpose. But, but he said that, that he believed that the mind-body connection was so strong that when you hooked up the new head to the old to the other person's body, the disconnect based on the different bodily signals that would be coming in, it would be so strong that the person would die just from that. And I thought that was an amazing testament to uh, to the idea that uh, that the mind and body are, are really wed together. Yeah, I had the fecal the fecal transplant was written down as my most surprising study from the book. And um, when you mentioned the people who were endeavoring to transplant heads, it reminded me of that scientist that you talk about, Heath. And uh, can you just say a little bit about him? Because I thought he was the most colorful, colorful character in the book and, and people might want to know a little bit. He's, I've never had heard of him, so I'm sure other people haven't either. Well, the reason that you haven't heard of him is that he was a failure, but he worked very um, uh, assiduously and and with a lot of support, financial and otherwise, for many years, he just never ended up getting anywhere. But uh, his his methods were very questionable, and this was taking place in the 40s and 50s when when that could be done. And he was interested in schizophrenia, and he actually had some good ideas about it. That that it was uh, you're not just crazy. That it, that it it stems from a physiological issue in your in your brain, and he thought it had to do with the reward system, and so he started poking around literally in people's brains with electrodes, trying to uh, find find out to to learn about the reward system. And um, of course, at the time, no one even believed there was a reward system, although it was discovered a few years later. Uh, but it turns out that schizophrenia has totally other causes and. His experiments were sloppy and uh, rather spectacularly cruel in some ways um, that I describe, and, uh, and you get a lot of interesting stories out of it. But but he didn't get a lot of interesting science out of it because it just wasn't even even the the ethical uh, issues aside. Um, his experiments were haphazard and and not really well controlled and. Uh, the technology wasn't really there to do what he was doing very well, and he didn't let that stop him. And so he just did a lot of sloppy work and um, worked from the late 40s till around 1970 and uh, published about 400 and some papers and no one's ever heard of them because he never really got anywhere because it wasn't a good scientist. So my question you know, there's in addition to the studies and and the and the stories about research, there are a lot of anecdotes that that work so well, but they feel kind of far flung. You know, they're like something from it seems like maybe a newspaper or something from a historical textbook or something. How did you how did you find all that stuff? And what were you just looking? Did you start by stumbling upon something and then decide to write a chapter about it, or did you have a chapter and go, I need to find an anecdote that serves this? No, I mean, I looked at, okay, what does the current research on emotions say? What are the most important points? What's the best order to present it? And then I get my chapters that way. And then I um, start looking for, of course, once I have all the research down that I want to talk about uh, and, all the, and all the principles and ideas uh, settled, then I look for interesting ways to present it. So my, I think my trademark is... Uh, or there's that, you know, something I can offer is to find uh, interesting stories as a storyteller, uh, both to tell them in an interesting way, but also to dig up interesting stuff. I mean, unexpected, like the head transplants and so forth. Uh, the guy who ate the airplane, um, 
uh, Heath with his, uh, you know, well, all the crazy stuff he did. And so I, 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 that would be like a treasure hunt for me. So I would know what I want to illustrate and I would, uh, scour the web, searching around, um, talk to, uh, emotion researchers. Cause sometimes they had stories that, that they may not be stories in, that appear in the research papers, but just the lore of the field that about interesting things. And, and I would just, eat it up. I mean, it would be a lot of fun when I found those gems, those really weird, wild, crazy, or just fascinating stories. So um, yeah, that, that's when then I would tell the story, uh, you know, of course, verify the story and do some research into the background. And that was painstaking. Uh, so, some of the stuff that's pretty obscure. I would dig up, you know, some out of print book that was written in 1961 and never appeared anywhere. And, you know, you kind of get wind of it and you're looking for it online here and there is not, maybe not been on the Google or that. And then you find out, oh, the Caltech library has a copy or something. And then you go and look up the stuff. And so that's how you get like the untold stories. <laughs> it's kind of like a, a treasure hunt, but it, it, you gotta, it takes a lot of effort. Yeah, my, and much of the storytelling is personal, you know, like the book struck me as ex, ex, extremely personal for you, you know, you, you write about your mom and both of your parents experiences in the Holocaust. How, you know, it, how did that, when did that come into the picture when you were learning about emotions? Like, when did you start to think about, you know, your parents and your experience as a child? Well, my parents uh, were in some ways to me larger than life uh, individuals <laughs> and they went through they both went through the holocaust my mother uh, lost her sister who she really looked up to her older sister and her her father her mother had already died um, and, and all her friends and uh, my fa my father lost his uh, four siblings and parents and uh, well one of his parents the other had died and um, and also his wife and child so they had horrible experiences and my father was in the underground and and then later in the concentration camp, my mother was in a forced labor camp like uh, Schindler's List. And so they had extremely, well, they had extreme experiences that affected them both uh, very deeply emotionally. And in all of my books, I seem to always have stories of uh, either of that, uh, you know, uh, stories from when I was growing up or some of my dad's stories from his uh, underground days that seemed to be relevant and uh, interesting. And especially in this case, because they both, um, they reacted so differently to their experiences. And my mother uh, is a, a, an extreme pessimist and, and and warrior who expected that any day things could all be taken away with no notice as they were. Um, my father uh, reacted kind of the opposite by being a, an optimist and a, a doer and very strong um, and so I, that's one of the things I wanted to explore in the book is why two different, why different people react to the same uh, situation in very different ways and why we even react in the way we do. So that's part of what I explore in the um, chapter on your emotional profile. Um, but I also wanted to know it basically, what is uh, an emotion and, and uh, you know, how do we even talk about it? Because before we can even talk about my mother's emotional life or my father's, most people don't even know if you, how would you describe an emotion? You say a feeling, but that's like giving a synonym. So let me just say, since we're about, we're, we're, we're well into the talk and I haven't even said what I mean by an emotion. Let me just, let me do that. Um, so in the literature, in, in this research literature, there, there, is, there are quite a few different definitions floating around that have some overlap and some not overlap. And the one that I thought made the most sense, especially to me as a hard scientist was, uh, the, the idea that emotion is a functional state of the brain. So what, what is the brain doing? What, what's the purpose of the brain? Well, the, on one level, the brain, of course, is operating your muscles and taking in the data from your senses. But what it does as a information processor is, it, is to take that information and calculate what's going to happen in the near future and where are there threats and what do you need in order to survive and thrive? So that's what your, your brain does. It's really an information processor. Now, it's not an information processor like a computer is, because the computer is linear, at least until the, there's been a revolution again in the last five or 10 years in how they do computer programming. Uh, uh, but the traditional way of doing it is, is linear, where you give a bunch of if-then statements or rules where, where the computer knows if A, then it does B, but if not A, it does something else, or if B, then it does C. And, and 
a bunch of rules like that get put together on some basic level in the computer to lead to everything, including like the picture you're looking at now. Um, and that that is um, it, those that's those are algorithms that that programmers invent, and they tell the computer what to do, and it just executes it. Um, modern or modern lately, the computers that are doing neural net programming and um, what they call deep learning, uh, the hardware is pretty much the same. We don't have highly connected, interconnected computers yet the way we have with our brains, but the idea is different. And the idea is more like the way our brains process information. So our brains have a hundred billion or so neurons with thousands of connections between them. And they learn what they, they, they process by learning, by being exposed to things and figuring out what's going on. And it's much more complicated than, than the linear way that people used to program. And before, so, so our brains are capable of, of, of quite a sophisticated logical processing. And by that, I mean, they apply rational thought, they apply the rules of logic. So a rule of logic is if A implies B and B implies C, then A implies C. So your brain can take all those rules of logic and it, just like a computer, it can manipulate them and, and come up with an answer to some question you pose or you know, what, what should I do? What should I think? How do I assess this? It's processing the information. But in order for it to process information, there's no programmer. What or who decides what information it processes, what information it sees as valid or important, what information is it skeptical of? How does it put this together? Uh, the, the, what, what your brain is, is doing information processing, it's taking the input from your senses, the sights and the sounds, the smells, et cetera. It's taking your past memories and and parts of that that might be relevant as information, your beliefs, your goals. And it's, it, it, it's forming a, a whole, let's say, um, setup of things to be input that your rational brain is then going to work on, okay? And that's where your emotions come in. Your emotions are a big influence on those other things. Now, it doesn't change, your emotions don't change the rules of logic, but they are what give your brain the inputs that are going to lead to outputs, and, and, and each emotion gives a different set and it's evolved to be based on a certain situation where a certain kind of thinking is better. And it gives your brain that set of, of information that your brain then processes. So it's not really separable from the logical rational processing. It's part of the whole process. And let me just give an example because that's so abstract. Uh, say you're, you're walking down the street. Uh, say I'm in downtown LA and I'm going to a restaurant where I'm, or a bar where I'm gonna meet a friend and have a drink, maybe have something to eat. And I'm deciding my pathway, maybe I'm thinking about what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna eat so I don't have to think about it there. I can just talk to my friend instead of staring at the menu. And so I'm trying to plan it out, how I'm getting there and so forth. And then something happens in, in, in my, in, by, and when I'm doing that, by the way, I don't hear a lot of things. I don't see a lot of things. My focus is on, the, is on what I just said. So a lot of faint noises or things that happen in your visual field don't actually make it to your conscious mind. I don't know if people realize this, but a lot, so much more input data is coming to your mind, to your conscious mind than you can handle that your unconscious processes it and only feeds some of it to you. For example, take the cocktail party effect. You're talking at a cocktail party to somebody and the rest of the room is just noise. And then someone says your name and suddenly you, you, did, you did hear something. So you're not, you don't hear the discussion of the people nearby you. It's all part of the noise until something relevant like your name comes up. And then your unconscious mind pushes that to consciousness and you become aware of it. So that's what's happening when you're walking down the street. Now, if something happens to put you in a fear state, a fear mode, everything changes. So the, the, uh, your, the, the data that you're, that you're processing that you even recognize changes. For example, your hearing gets much better small noises that might have passed through, gone over your head, so to speak, or gone out one, in one ear and out the other, they now get attended to. So suddenly you're aware of consciously uh, a lot more of your sensory input than you were when you were in the other state, when you were just hungry and wanting to get to see your friend. Also, your hunger vanishes. You don't even feel the hunger anymore if you're really afraid. You won't think about it. You won't feel it. So uh, this is what I mean by the, the, the emotion shaping the kind of data that your brain is processing. And your, your goal changes, of course. You're, you're not, now when you get to the, the street that you have to turn on, you're not making that decision based on which is the, is the quickest way, but rather which is the safest way. And even if you're not, uh, even if you're not aware of 
changing your mode of thinking. That's what's happening. Your emotion will change the mode of thinking that you're operating under. And in the laboratory, we can distill this and really see it very uh, sharply and quantitatively even. Um, so one more example. That was an example from the real life. Now I'll give you an example from the, from the lab, which is less real than real life. It's not that natural, but it's, it's simpler and, and very easy to see. Uh, this, ha this experiment has to do with, with disgust. Uh, experimenters took their subjects and put them in a state of disgust, half of them in a state of disgust, and half of them in a neutral state. And then uh, at the end, they offered to buy from them a pen that they had been given a, as a gift at the beginning of the experiment, and they, they offered to buy it back. Now, one of the aspects of disgust in your mental state, uh, the what way it affects your mental state, is to give you uh, a propensity to get to rid yourself of things. So obviously, disgust evolved uh, to help us choose our food. And if you, if you ate something bad, your feeling of disgust, you spit it out. But more generally, researchers have found that if we're in a state of disgust, the mental state of disgust causes you to want to rid yourself of things more. And so that's, that affects then your rational digestion of, of data. So what they found was that the that the subjects who were in a state of disgust, when they uh, were asked if they wanted to sell their pen at what price, their price was around, I think, $2.50. And the average price for the people who were in the neutral state was about $4.50, almost twice as much. So in that one instance, you can il it illustrates how they're both processing the same data about whatever the brand of the pen was, the quality of the pen, or whatever their data they're processing about the pen to decide on the price. But the difference is that they evaluated things differently in the discussed state versus the non-discussed state. So their logical processing still occurred in the same way, but all that stuff that's wrapped around it was different and it brought them to a different conclusion. I found you were talking about um, emotion that was, you know, generated or inspired or instigated in a lab. I found some one of the most disturbing parts of the book to me was the uh, research by social media companies into into users emotional states like for example i think the term is um sentiment analysis by facebook can you um can you talk a little bit about what what you know how people might be using effective neuroscience research for you know other purposes so there's a lot of interesting studies that were done in, in social media and some somewhat maybe nefarious sounding studies as well um, the sentiment analysis is interesting. They've taught computers how to read natural language that people write their, their postings, let's say, uh, or um, their writings, if they're writing something longer, and to determine what their emotion is uh, based on that. So obviously, a humans can do that. If I'm writing an angry um, email, few people would have trouble, trust me, when I write one, would have trouble understanding that I'm angry. And if you're writing one that's loving or happy and so forth, people can understand that. But now computers can understand that too. They've uh, been able to trade. I think they were neural net uh, deep learning uh, programs that, that did this, by the way. Uh, it'd be a lot harder with a regular old fashioned program. And um, so uh, that's sentiment analysis. And the reason that's really cool is that we can analyze huge masses of data that way. So they're talking about, uh, in some cases, people analyzing hundreds of thousands of messages or postings. So obviously you're not going to have armies of people, humans doing the sentiment analysis, but you can run it through a computer. And so they found some in different experiments. Uh, I won't get into who did what exactly, but, and some of them are Twitter, Facebook, but what they found was that there, there were two areas, well, two scientific areas that were kind of um, interesting that they did. One was um, emotional contagion. Uh, and that was to, to, to look at how people react in their future postings after they get a posting from somebody that expresses a certain emotion. So you can study someone's postings and say they're neutral. And then you can see that they get a, that in their stream, there's a, an angry posting. And then you can see, are they angry after that? To what extent, or what's their level of anger over hundreds of thousands of people? And that was very interesting because you could see the emotional contagion. You could also see, there was another experiment, separate one, did something somewhat similar, but they're looking at uh, emotion regulation. So in, at the end of the book, I talk about how when our emotions get out of control, 
uh, or they persist longer than is than is good for us. Say the situation is over, but the emotion persists. Um, you might you might want to change your emotional state and regulate it. They call that regulation, and there's different techniques for that. And one of them is just expression. So we all know if I write a flame email, it makes me feel better, and especially if I don't send it. <laughs> so I get pissed at somebody. I write a flame email. I put it in the drafts box, and I say I'll send it tomorrow. And then tomorrow I feel better already. I go, oh, I'm glad I didn't send that. So that's expression. Well, what they did in this, in this mass study was they, they studied uh, people's uh, emotions and identified, it took, I think, 800,000 users and picked out like 100,000 who, who, whose, whose postings seemed to, to indicate a certain emotional state like anger. Um, and, and, and then they, they looked at uh, a, uh, what happened after they expressed the anger, and uh, what they found was that 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 diffused that 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 ex that by expressing that emotion, it diffused their feeling of it. So those are two good studies. Now, what the bad studies are, of course, they the the, the social media. Well, I wouldn't shouldn't say bad studies, but of course, they do studies meant to learn how they could hook and addict people more to to their to their apps and what 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 kind of emotional feelings. Uh, for example, emotional contagion of anger tends to bring people back uh, and they kind of get addicted to sharing and experiencing the anger together and they keep coming back to the to the to the uh, social media. So that's those are cases where they're trying to hook you uh, using uh, studies of emotion. That's kind of just, you know, dystopian and it, it had me thinking about this might not be a question that you can answer, but I'm curious. You know, it seems like we, you know, we started evolutionarily with a primitive re reflex system or, or response and we've and sort of been evolving and emotion is happening on this continuum of evolution. Uh, like, where do you think, you know, all this is heading? Do roboticists program emotions into their, into their robots? Like, do you think it's, some, do you think it's gonna be something that's kind of uh, meted out of, of human experience somehow? They don't do that, and they have. I think they're going to have to. I'm not sure they're going to program it in. So remember, the new way of programming, which is so much superior, is to set up a, the, the computer or the brain as a as a system that learns by itself. And so you, you set it up as a system, and you put them in a situation where it can learn. Of course, there's a lot of technical details to that. It's not at all easy, but but what happens is the program itself then evolves to get better and better at solving whatever the problem is that you're building it to solve. And my belief is that oh, right now there's no general purpose computers like that. So each program, no general purpose program like that, each program is there for a certain reason to play the game of Go, for example, or to play chess or to identify cancer in an X-ray. So people don't have the ability to create general purpose machines of that type but they, they can create them that to solve a specific, very specific problem. Of course, I've created two, two, two machines like that because I've had two kids that, that, uh, that, that were given birth from my, from my sperm. I have three kids, one's adopted, um, who I'm affected to, but in, her nurture, in the nurturing way. But, but we can all create these kinds of computers. That's called a person. And so I think that eventually we'll be able to do that with robots too, but we're far away from that. I don't know if we're 50 years or 500 years or 5,000 years available away from it, but it, it certainly seems feasible or possible. And I believe that along the way, when we create systems that complex, emotions will be part of the evolution of those systems. Uh, not that the programs are gonna put it in, it's just going to develop just as it has with us and with other animals. So we haven't talked about it, but um, uh, the belief today is that uh, if you think of emotions in the way I just said as a, mental state of processing of your brain, uh, all, well, animals, even as simple as fruit flies uh, exhibit emotions. And I talk about some of that fun studies about fruit flies uh, and, and their emotional life. So, so that's something that seems to come with information processing at, at a certain level. And my chapters on motivation uh, touch on that because if you think about a robot that doesn't have any um, emotion or any pleasure feelings, why would it do anything? So think, think, what, what emotions do is drive us to, to action. 
And without emotion, we, we would not do anything. A robot would, would, would just sit there um, unless, okay, the robot is programmed to identify certain triggers in the environment that cause an action. So that's the way uh, traditional robots work. They're if then statements, right? So if, uh, I, if the robot sees fire, the robot is programmed to leave. Um, maybe the programmer didn't think about smoke and, and if there's a lot of smoke in the room and the program the, the comp and, the, and the robot is not programmed to also leave when there's smoke, the robot is not going to leave when there's smoke. The robot is not going to be motivated to do anything. But a robot that feels emotion will, because emotion is more general, it accepts a more general definition of inputs and gives you a more general definition of outputs and lets your mental processing figure out how to connect the diff whatever the input is to whatever is appropriate output. So if I'm sitting there, and something weird in general is happening, like the smoke or the fire, that could trigger an emotion in me, like alarm or fear. Now my processor, my uh, logical processor is going to take in the information, smoke, fire, uh, uh, how far away I am, whatever other information there is. Uh, with the fear, my also my goals and my beliefs and my memories and all that, and it's going to come out with a answer, which might be throw water on it, leave the room, or something else. But there's a when you have emotions, give a layer between the 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 trigger and the response. They allow there to be an extra layer of processing, and, and that can motivate you to do things. So a computer sitting sitting uh, at the table might just get bored, right? That's an emotion, boredom and decide to do something. But uh, a computer that has no emotion would never do that. It would just sit there. I thought uh, we could take a few questions now um, since we're coming to the end. Um, one question that came in is whether or not you distinguish between emotion and feeling. I know you, you addressed this in the book, but, but a question came in. No, uh, so feeling, the, the distinction is only that, uh, so they're kind of interchangeable and they're used interchangeably in, in, in a lot of the literature, but sometimes people make a distinction that a feeling is the, is the conscious component of an emotion. So an emotion can act on unconscious as well as conscious uh, level. And some people, by the way, even disagree with that, but I think it's, it's uh, commonly believed or under, understood that way that, that emotions can have common um, conscious and unconscious effects. For example, fear makes your heart beat. You don't say, oh, I'm afraid I better have my heart beat faster. It just happens. Um, sometimes it happens before you're even conscious of the fear. So, uh, so feeling has to do with the conscious experience of emotion. Uh, any other questions, just, just fire them into the, to the chat box. I, um, I was wondering um, what you're thinking about, if you are thinking about for a next project, or is that something that has to gestate over an extended period of time like, like this book did? Yeah, I, I go through different, uh, I go through different uh, iterations and sometimes I, I write some amount and then I say, eh, I'm not liking it, you know, so I, it takes me a while. Uh, right now I'm excited about writing a novel, so we'll see what happens with that. Um, and I have some other ideas for nonfiction, but I haven't really uh, landed on anything yet. And what's your relationship with theoretical physics? I found, I found it interesting that you've made it all the way to the brain. Um, do you still- Well, I, yeah. I still publish papers. You can you know, look them up, look on Google Scholar or something. But I, yeah, I've always, uh, good thing about being a theoretical physicist is uh, even when I left academia, I continue, can continue to do it. I don't need a laboratory or millions of dollars to run the lab or have assistants and, and underlings and graduate students to work for me. So um, I've, um, over the years, even when I'm not in the university, I continue to uh, do physics research, enjoy it quite a bit, get a lot of satisfaction out of it and keep publishing. I keep publishing papers in that uh, even while I'm doing my, um, you know, my other career of writing these books. What, um... Is there a topic in neuroscience that you feel is un, uh, like remains unaddressed and that you think is maybe the next new um, revolution? Well, uh, I'll tell you one, one thing, which is, I wouldn't say it's unknown yet. It's, it's starting to be addressed quite a bit, but it's, I think, a revolution uh, coming called the connectome, which is uh, the study of the connectivity of the brain. So it used to be thought not totally, but more or less that the brain has different structures that have certain purposes and they kind of all work together. 
So for example, in the old theory or traditional theory of emotion, which, which is wrong, people thought that there was a certain seat of this emotion, a certain place where that emotion happens. Like the amygdala was the fear, right? And, and um, we know that that's not true anymore. I, 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 uh, there, there are different kinds of fear. Some fear uses amygdala, some doesn't. The amygdala is involved in many, uh, many different emotions. So it's not the fear organ at all. And there's even, we know about different parts of the amygdala that, that do different things. So that it's just much more complicated than we thought. And what uh, it seems to be is that there are distributed networks of different nodes and neurons that, that are behind a lot of this. And it's, it's very complicated, but it has to do with, with what's connected to what. And people now with new technology can actually study all, they can make a, you know, a wiring chart of the, of the brain. And they're doing that for simple animals. Um, I, I guess uh, they're doing the rat or the mouse up in uh, where Christoph Koch is now in, in at the Allen Brain Institute, for example. They've done the, the C. elegans, the roundworm. Um, so the problem is, or the question is, uh, it's one thing to do that, which is an amazing technological feat, uh, given how tiny neurons are and how many connections they have. But understanding what it means, of course, is the goal. And that's another order of magnitude even harder. But I think once we start to do that, and that's just in its infancy, we will really get a very much deeper understanding of uh, uh, our thinking and our consciousness. I think this is an interesting question um, that came in, which is, so if fruit flies have emotions, can they suffer? And does that affect human ethics in any meaningful way? That's a good question. So We haven't really, this is my, again, my friend Christoph, so interested in consciousness. So what does he do? Does he study consciousness? Well, I, I mean, before he went off to do the connect home, but, but um, you don't, you can't really study consciousness yet because we don't really know enough even to define it very well. He studied the visual system of the brain and how we do visual processing and tried to relate that somehow to the, to experience. So the same thing applies to this question. Um, we can't really say, forget a fruit flight, does your dog have consciousness? Does a goose have consciousness? We, we tend to sometimes think it does, but we have to be careful for anthropomorphizing. For example, when you see a, a mother goose on a nest and an egg falls out, the, the goose will roll the egg back into the nest. It looks like a conscious thing that the mother goose is doing, loving, motherly action. But if you put a baseball next to the nest, she'll bring that in. If you put a, a volleyball even, she'll try and get that into the nest. Whatever, you, you could put in a, an old battery and she'll try and pick that up if it's big enough. So we learned it said so that this is a, what we call reflexive action. There's this trigger, which is something next to the nest, brings a response, bring it in. She evolved a whole, uh, the, the mother, the geese evolved a whole package of those to deal with everyday life. And when things are unchanging and when you're not in a novel situation, that works very well. So she, if, if the egg falls out, she brings it in. When you're in a very strange situation with some pesky uh, researcher putting a, a melon next to your nest, then it, then it doesn't work too well because you're not built for that. And, and so, um, um, so what we can easily mistake um, conscious uh, behavior for unconscious, non-conscious, and, and, and researchers are extremely careful not to really try not to jump any, any conclusions about which animals have consciousness or not. So, but we, what we can study is emotion in different animals, not the feeling or the conscious experience, but the emotion as a state of information processing. So I won't go into it now because we're almost at the end. But when I talk about the emotion, uh, the experiments on the fruit flies uh, in the book, it is from the point of view of, uh, you can see the effect on their mental processing of information based on what their uh, emotional state, such as a fear state. And um, you can see their choices. So I'll leave you, why don't we leave you with one kind of interesting uh, uh, incident where they're studying the fruit flies and fruit flies have certain mating uh, rituals and the uh, male basically presents itself to the female in certain ways. The female does certain things to say yes or no. And then the male can either mate with it or it's rejected. And they found that the rejected fruit flies when given a choice to go to two different areas, one of which has alcohol and one of which doesn't, 
they start choosing preferentially the alcohol after they've had sexual uh, romantic, well, I shouldn't say romantic, but sexual rejection. So uh, that seems awful human-like, but we're not saying that the, that the fruit fly actually was doing any thinking there, who knows? I think that's a great place to end because it illustrates the type of, there's a type of study and a type of information that's given in this book that there's a certain humor about it I found. Um, which I thought was really pleasant. And uh, I urge everybody to pick up a copy because it was extremely informative and entertaining. And um, it's just full of, of useful and fascinating information. And mine, it was great to talk to you. Great talking to you too, thanks. Yep. Thank you so much, guys. Um, in the chat, I just uh, put a link to Len's new book there. It comes out tomorrow. Uh, click on that link, buy it from us if you can. And uh, we also have our YouTube channel and I posted a link to that uh, just now as well. Click on that and you can check out some of our events that we've done in the past um, in our uh, Zoom era of uh, author events. And this event will be uh, showing up there on our YouTube channel probably sometime tomorrow. If you have some friends or other people who you think would enjoy it and you wanna share it with others, please do so, that's always great. Uh, Len and Ben and everyone at home, thanks again for this great talk this evening and uh, have a good night. Thank you. Bye.